Again, we want to wish everyone a happy Resurrection Sunday morning. What a blessing it is to gather and to worship uh, the Lord, the risen Lord. And uh, again, we want to welcome each and every one of you here. We uh, praise the Lord for our staff and ministers who come out to faithfully uh, minister as before the Lord, that we might be able to uh, uh, get this... Uh, message aired to you today and broadcast. Uh, we want to just uh, open up in a word of prayer before we get going. Father God, we do want to thank you for this morning, Lord. What a great, beautiful morning you've given us to worship you, Lord. And even as we gaze out the windows this morning, Lord, we see the, the bright sunshine and the blue skies, Lord, and the cool breeze uh, blowing, Lord, and we thank you. Lord, we praise you. What an awesome uh, representation of what it must have been like on that first resurrection Sunday morning, Lord. We thank you for your love and your grace and your beauty. We thank you for the resurrection power that raised you from the dead, Jesus, would one day raise us uh, all again uh, to be with you in all eternity. Father, we thank you for the opportunity again. We have to worship you this morning. We pray you bless now as we worship you through the study of your word. We thank you, Father. We praise you for all who are here and all that are uh, watching uh, uh, through the internet, Lord, and through the various uh, channels. And Father, pour out richly your saving grace and your encouragement and your healing touch for those who need your healing, Lord. We thank you, Father. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen. Hey, guys, the, the events leading up to our service uh, today has been... Uh, quite a out of the ordinary. I know that you guys agree with this, but life has been changed kind of topsy-turvy for most of us uh, 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 with this COVID-19 uh, pandemic that has grown and uh, uh, encapsulated most of the world, guys. Uh, uh, it has been taking its toll on so many. Lives have been lost. Lives have been touched uh, by symptoms. Lives in flux. Lives in limbo uh, because of this great disease. I know that we instituted a uh, a curfew uh, uh, earlier this weekend and uh, again uh, the streets must have been just empty uh, from those uh, uh, morning hours the late evening and uh, early morning hours uh, 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 gigantic economies grinding to a halt as uh, unemployment lines grow and uh, what a thing is going on small businesses shutter their doors lines for food and services grow longer and longer we hear on tv that uh, actually the unemployment uh, lines are so great uh, the people can't get through to apply for unemployment because so many people are unemployed at this moment but uh, uh, it's a it's a great thing for us. It's a great opportunity that we have to remember to pray for those. Just a, a way of reminder this morning: our live and archive messages. Uh, uh, you know, you can go to Calvary Chapel Downtown dot org for links to our live Sunday morning and Wednesday midweek services, as well as previously aired messages can be viewed there on Calvary Chapel. Uh, at downtown.org. Ministry and prayer requests, guys. You know, a lot of times we might be praying for people on Saturday morning, Sunday evening, Sunday morning, Wednesday night. We don't have the opportunity to gather. Most people are shut, home, shut in at home, but uh, uh, please email the church office with any prayer needs or requests. Mail to Calvary Chapel downtown at gmail.com. Uh, we can get back to you. Oh, excuse me, Calvary downtown at at gmail.com calvary downtown at gmail.com or you can mail your uh request to p.o box 37 507 honolulu hawaii 96837 uh this again it's it's all on our website but uh please remember please uh, send those uh prayer requests in calvary chapel calvary downtown, calvary downtown at gmail.com Again, with the COVID-19 ongoing, the ramifications of this deadly disease, please pray for those who, who have been so dramatically affected. Some are filled, fear, uh, filled with fear and despair. Others are filled with discouragement and anxiety uh, as they look at people with, uh, with kind of with suspicion. You know, they say, hey, I wonder if you got the disease. I wonder if you got them. They look at you, they, they'll cross the street to get away from you. And uh, uh, it's a real funny thing. But uh, for us, we ought to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, uh, 
uh, again, there are many again afflicted by this. And we don't want to take it lightly. We don't want to joke around about it. But uh, we ought to be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within us. But why don't we turn in our Bibles for you who are here. We're going to be continuing in our study through um, uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. We're in, uh, uh, but you know, Easter has a special uh, memory and a special remembrance for me. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to date myself. But you know, gone are the more simple days of Leave it to Beaver. And the only reason why I know some of these old shows is I watch some of these cable channels and they have these old programs on. But the simpler days of Leave it to Beaver, there was a, uh, things like American Bandstand and the Ed Sullivan Show. We remember growing up as kids uh, watching these programs, but Easter was always, uh, uh, Easter always meant Good Friday, and Good Friday was always a great Friday. You know why? No school. <laughs> we didn't have school. You know, so Good Friday was really a great Friday because it started a long weekend. It was even greater yet. No more homework and all of this, but it also meant that, uh, you know, we'd, uh, we'd have that long weekend and it was filled with coloring Easter eggs. And you know, then the, after the Easter egg coloring became the Easter egg hunts. And uh, that, that always included, you know, a gathering, a family gathering. There was always a big ham and, you know, Auntie Doris's potato salad. And you know, it was a good, good time, you know, fond memories. Uh, uh, there were always, of course, the older kids they weren't always fair when they played the Easter egg fights, you know, as you, you bang the eggs uh, head to head and into, into each other. They always seemed to get in sideways and smash the side of your egg. And, you know, that was about par, good fun, you know, the older kids taking care of the young, taking advantage of the younger kids. It was all in good humor. But today, you know, this weekend, this particular weekend, uh, with the illnesses hitting us close to home, guys, you know, things, the simplicity and the innocence of, uh, of simpler days are all gone. Now, you know, we, 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 we are shut in insulation, just uh, wishing, hey, I miss going to Long's. Hey, Sunday, I better look at the Sunday newspaper and see what's on sale at Long's. Maybe I can run to Long's, but people are even hesitant to do, go there. Uh, and I say, oh, I like to go to Walmart and walk around, but you know, it, it's, a, it's a bad thing that, hey, you're not supposed to be out, not unless you really need something. Um, you know, my man, the battery in my car is going dead. The battery in my motorcycle is probably dying. I haven't been out riding and uh, uh, just getting out. You know, you probably see the fear in people's eyes, some filled with panic, others looking again with suspicion at others. And this, this is the age we live in, unfortunately, with this disease. But all that to say, uh, say this today, guys, that Jesus Christ came to deal with the greatest disease of all, which is sin. Sin is that thing that says, hey, we missed the mark. Sin is the thing that says that no matter how hard we tried, we could never really get it right on target, right on the old kini popo. But, uh, but uh, this sin is that has plagued man since the beginning of time. And much of this uh, uh, last week, Jesus, uh, in this last week of Jesus' life, he addressed the religious leaders who were so confident in their good works and their righteousness. And they, you know, they thought uh, more like self-righteousness. You know, uh, it wasn't their righteousness, but it was a self-righteousness. And like today, many are comfortable in their charitable giving. Hey, Russell, I gave at the office, man. I signed up for the Aloha United Way. Oh, I gave, or I, 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 I live a good life, or I do good. I think I'm okay. And you know, much like these religious leaders, they sought to put Jesus to death. And we pick our study up in uh, Matthew 26 uh, today, verses 1 to 4. He says, and when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. And the chief priests and the elders and the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas, and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and to kill him. You know, here the Passover uh, was coming. It was a great holiday. It spoke of the Passover lamb being killed in Egypt and how the homes of the uh, Israelis were anointed with the blood of the lamb. And as the angel passed over Egypt, uh, you know, the, those whose homes had been anointed by the blood were spared any harm, any death coming upon them. And, you know, the, the, the people of Israel looked towards the coming of the 
uh, the Savior, the Lamb of God, and yet they fail to recognize that Jesus has come as the Lamb of God. They plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and to kill him. And the bottom line is that uh, was to take Jesus out. They just wanted Jesus out. Jesus came, he rocked the boat. Things were not going normal. He was bad for business at the temple marketplace. And he spoke against the religious leaders. And he says, your religiosity is not good enough. And here are the religious leaders, uh, the priests and the scribes, those legal eagles are plotting, uh, plotting murder. How's that picture? You know, these guys are religious guys. They're supposed to be the religious leaders of the land. Yet in their hearts and minds, they plotted murder. They say, we got to take this Jesus out. In verse 7, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume. She reclined uh, it on his head, and uh, she poured it on his head and he as he reclined at the table. And in preparation for his death, we're told, uh, in John's Gospel that Mary, Lazarus' uh, sister, took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed Jesus. Uh, uh, all this for uh, uh, came great criticism. She came under criticism because this perfume would cost about the better part of a year's wages. Just imagine, hey, I had to work almost a whole year to buy this perfume, and now you've wasted it upon this guy, Jesus. You've anointed him, and what a waste of money those, the, you know, the guys criticized her. And probably it was some of the guys who were thinking that, hey, we could have used that money for something better. We could have taken a, our cut of that money. We could have had a piece of that action. Yet now all that money is gone. She anointed Jesus. And again, she came under great criticism. Uh, so great a gift, but money was no, uh, of no consequence to this woman, Mary. So great a gift that it, 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 it didn't matter how much it cost, and she would give her all in worship and adoration uh, for our Lord, her, her Lord, in preparation for his crucifixion. Remember the passing over and eat uh, again. Now after the Passover with his disciples, retiring to the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane for prayer. I'm just kind of reading ahead or telling you the story ahead of time, guys. Uh, uh, a mob did come with swords and clubs to take Jesus captive, who in turn would take him uh, to Caiaphas, the high priest, and, and then he who in turn would take him to Pilate, the governor. You know, Jesus says, hey, you come uh, to me under the cover of darkness. Every day I was in the temple uh, teaching and uh, being available, yet you come under to me for the power of darkness. It's interesting to note that uh, uh, the one who betrayed Jesus was looking for an opportune time. And in the Gospel of uh, Luke, we know that after the temptation of Jesus, the devil looked for him waiting for an opportune time. And it seems that the enemy was looking for an opportune time to take our Lord out. I want to just remind us all here uh, listening and watching today that at times, no matter how good things are moving along with the Lord, how great our relationship with Him, our walk is ongoing, the enemy is always looking for that opportune time to come and to take us out, to knock us down, to hit us uh, where it hurts, and again, uh, stymie the work of God that God is doing in our uh, life. Matthew 27, 18, guys. Matthew 27, 18. If you fast forward with me. I like to read 27. Uh, Starting in 27, verse 15 through 17, we'll start there. Now at the feast of the governor, he was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. And at that time, they were holding a notorious, a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? And uh, uh, for he knew that it was over envy, they had handed him over to him. Pilate himself knew what was in the heart of people, what was in the heart of man. He saw the big picture. He was kind of removed from the situation of the Jewish uh, religious hierarchy. And he looked as a ruler overlooking the whole land. But he saw that they were filled with envy. They were filled with jealousy. They were filled with fear. And anger held those 
uh, whose hearts uh, uh, of Jesus' captors. And we can see the things of the flesh, that as people envy what God is doing, as the enemy uh, sees with great jealousy, man, that guy who was mine or that gal who was mine, all of a sudden now Jesus has gotten a hold of their heart. Uh, uh, there's fear that, hey, we're going to lose them. Anger held uh, uh, the hearts of those, Jesus' captors, uh, uh, in check. Uh, it says that while he was sitting, verse 19, on the judgment seat, his wife sent him, sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Uh, uh, even the wife of Pilate bore witness in her heart, calling Jesus that righteous man. And sometimes we think that hey, people don't know, but people are watching, people are observing what's going on. It could be somebody close, like a close friend, a close relative, a husband or a wife. Hey, things are not going right, but in her heart, you know, the Lord was doing a work. In her heart, uh, the wife sent that message, have nothing to do with that righteous man. And again, God was speaking to her heart that hey, things, uh, the things of the Lord were good things. And the things that these religious leaders and the popular way said, hey, are we with Jesus? You see, the same thing is happening in the world today, guys. As you're a Christian or you take the label of being a Christian, people don't want to listen to you. Uh, we can, again, I can, I say it time and time again that our own, uh, uh, our own government leaders, as we testify before them uh, during pr public hearings, as we testify about things like abortion or same-sex marriage or uh, uh, legalized uh, marijuana and things like that, they really don't want to hear from the Christian. They say that, oh, there's a segment of the population called Christians. And uh, uh, we will listen to them, we'll hear them out, but you know, we've already discounted their voice. We're, we've already discounted their vote. And uh, we, we just won't hear it. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear them, but uh, it's again, it's going right over the top of our heads, in our hearts, in our minds, in our eyes. We're rolling our eyes because we're saying that, hey, listen to these crazy Christians. The world still can't figure out how uh, ministries on go and go on and how the Christian body of Christ continues to function. I, I think that they look at uh, ministries like the River of Life Mission. The River of Life Mission doesn't take any money from any government entity. They take no support from these, uh, these powers to be that want to uh, make them move and shape them and, and tell them how, how they ought to do uh, their ministry and so on and so forth. The river is, is, is strictly uh, supported by the Lord and by God's people and by people moved and, 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 and uh, uh, saying that hey, there, there's a good work ongoing. And the, uh, the government leaders and people, they look and they said, how can it happen? This is really, it doesn't make any sense. If you look at it from a business point of view, it doesn't pencil out. The bottom line doesn't pencil out. This, their budget, they feed and they clothe and they minister and, and there's no funds coming in you know, from the government entities and these charitable organizations that seek to tell them what to do. But God is like that. God is moving in ways that we cannot think or imagine. And especially the world, they gnash their teeth as they look at the ministry and they, as they look at God's people and they say, how can they continue to go on like this? How can they continue uh, to uh, be moved and to, and to continue to do these things in the name of this one called Jesus? Again, uh, 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 Pilate's wife said, have nothing to do with that, with that righteous man, for I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Uh, 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 verses 20 to 24, we go on, and uh, uh, he says, The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas to, and to put Jesus to death. And when the governor said to them, Which one of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? They said, They all said, Crucify him. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? And they kept shouting, all the more saying, crucify him, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, he, uh, uh, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd saying, I am innocent 
of this man's blood. See to, uh, to that yourselves. And you know, Pilate gave the people every opportunity of a way out. Okay, we can release uh, this one who uh, called Jesus, who's the Christ, and uh, we can uh, just let him go because he hasn't done anything really wrong. They had no substantial charges against them. And Barabbas was, on, on, on the other hand, a real bad hombre, a real evil doer. He was probably a kidnapper, a murderer, I don't know. But uh, again, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, deserving of, of punishment. And yet Jesus had not done nothing wrong. Uh, to uh, deserve death and they kept saying crucify him crucify him and, and Pilate being a reasonable man he says hey I, I wash my hands of this matter and you know you, you, you may have heard that term in the world uh, oh I wash my hands of this I wash my hands of that and here's, a, here's where it comes from exactly it's like saying yeah I take no responsibility in this part I have no part and parcel with what is going on. And Pilate did the same thing for all men to remember. He, wa he took the water, he washed his hands, and saying that uh, I, have, uh, I am innocent of this man's blood. And he's saying that yeah, I have nothing to do with what this murderous thoughts and deeds that you have on your heart and mind. Uh, 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 really, again, uh, it fell upon deaf ears. But you know, man and woman, I want you to remember that God's plan for the redemption of the world and for all mankind would not be set aside. You know, we think that we can blame these religious leaders and we think we can blame this mob that says, hey, crucify him and crucify him. But the, the chosen one would keep his appointment uh, with the cross, guys. It was God's foreordained plan that Jesus Christ would come as a savior, as a sacrifice once and for all, uh, for all mankind, that he would lay his life down for us in substitution of all the sin that separated us from, from, uh, uh, from, from God. And you can say, hey, Russell, I lived a good life. I haven't really done anything wrong. I haven't killed, I haven't murdered, I haven't stolen. And, you know, so sometimes I get angry when I drive in traffic and you know, and I get angry at my coworker, or I, I snap at my wife, or I bark at my husband, whatever it might be. But you know, I'm really not such a bad person. Uh, the, does, did Jesus have to die for me for that? And again, uh, there's that justification, you know, self-justification saying, hey, it's just as if I've never sinned, God, but you know, I'll have sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God. And, uh, 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 you, you know, we, we, we can echo the words of John, uh, John the Beloved in his gospel. As Jesus was revealed to him, he just simply says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. And no matter how good or how bad we've been, and sometimes uh, it's easier for the bad guy. They really said that, hey, I, I really was a bad person. I know that I did this. I know that I did that. And... I, I do need a savior, I do need forgiveness. And it's at times it's uh, for that, uh, that righteous person, that one like these, these religious leaders, they said that, hey, we give, we do good. You know, we don't, uh, uh, we don't covet, we don't take, we haven't murdered or stolen, and uh, why do I need a sinner? I'm, I'm good on my own. But you know, God says, no, again, all have sinned, all have fall, fallen short of the glory of God. And here again, we go on. I'm reading ahead into the story. Well, they stripped Jesus and they put a scarlet robe upon him. They adorned him with a crown of thorns, guys. And, you know, many of us have seen that picture of the passion of Christ. And as we, you know, maybe you saw it years ago. I know that we saw it years ago at the, one of the local theaters down here. We uh, rented the whole theater. We went in and saw that. And the graphic uh, portrayal of Jesus's... Uh, crucifixion, you know, and the beating and the scourging and the crown of thorns. It was so graphic. It's, you know, I saw that movie years ago and I've never seen it again, but the pictures are vividly emblazoned on my mind. The brutality of his captors, the brutality of the scourging and the whipping, the brutality of the, uh, of the cross. They stripped him, they adorned him with that crown of thorns. They mocked and spit upon him. They brutalized him, guys. And you know, all the brutality, all the hard things of the world, all the hard things of, of sin, all the whipping, all the scourging uh, took place as they crucified him. 
the Gospels all agree that he was mocked. You know, first of all, that people were wagging their heads at him. And you kind of think that, hey, what is wagging their heads at him? You know, and you kind of think that, I think that uh, wagging, you can you think of it, the dog wags its tail. But the wagging says that, hey, they nodded their heads. Hey, Jesus, what about this? You know, and they, 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 they came in derision. They came in scorn. They came, you know, mocking him and, and, and uh, c crying out to him. What about, you said that you, you could uh, save yourself. Why don't you save yourself? You know, you save that you could save others but they mocked him they wagged their heads at him uh, they casted their insults upon him they spit upon him they beat, beat him uh, all the uh, all the while they uh, 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 it was destined uh, all the all the humiliation guys that was destined to fall upon uh, us fell upon him all the humiliation all the sh the sin of shame and you, you can kind of think that, uh, you might think that, hey, there are things that I'm not proud about. There are things that I don't want the whole world to be revealed because they, th they think that, hey, Russell was a pretty good guy. No, hey, Russell was a bad guy. But, you know, if you, you think of uh, some of these other guys like, like you know, uh, uh, like Mike and... Uh, like Les over here, or maybe, oh, you see, see, Les is pointing to Hank. Oh, you want to see a bad guy, you really, uh, you really got to see a bad guy. And I see, uh, I see here this other brother over here smiling. He says, hey, he was a bad dude that smiles at us. So, <laughs> and again, we think that all, all the things that he'd done, all the things, uh, uh, the brutality for his shortcomings, for our shortcomings, he took upon himself, guys. In the last moments, he responded to one of those being crucified alongside with him. The Gospels tell us he was crucified in between these two thieves, and they were mocking him and, and casting insults at him. And one of them said, hey, you know, uh, we deserve to be here, but this this man Jesus, he he doesn't he didn't do anything to deserve this, and you know he's crying out to the Lord. He says, "Hey Lord, save me! Hey Lord, you know help me, man!" And and uh, in, in, at the very last moments of his life, the thief on the cross will be remembered for all time as one who would reach out to the Lord, receiving the promise of eternal life. See, God is not slow about His promise, uh, about His coming, and He desires that none would perish, but all come to that everlasting life. And at times, He gives man, He gives people, you and I and others out there watching by way of the internet, He gives them opportunity to, to come to the very end of their lives, the very end of themselves before they can say yes to Jesus and no to the way of the world, no to the way of the flesh. And you've heard of those uh, deathbed conversions. You've heard about those that we've carried into the water down at Waikiki Beach and baptized them as they were literally passing from, uh, from one life into the other. They've given their lives to the Lord. The very last moments of the very last moments of their life, the very last days of their life, they come to the Lord, they confess Him as Lord and Savior, and they want to take that step of faith or have others take the step of faith for them as we carry them into the water and lay them down in that water as a symbol of putting the old man aside and being raised up in that newness of life in Christ Jesus. Those uh, celebrations on the Easter Sunday sunrise services as we've baptized many, uh, and the baptisms at the, the potlucks and stuff down at the beach park uh, will always be remember, uh, memorable uh, uh, for those receiving the Lord and receiving the promise of eternal life, receiving the forgiveness of sin. John, John's gospel receive, uh, records for us one of Jesus' last words, I am thirsty. He says, I am thirsty. And, and perhaps as he said uh, on the uh, Sermon on the Mount, he said that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And I don't know if uh, there's any real correlation or real connection with that, because I think that he was talking to the people who were listening, but maybe it, perhaps uh, it applied to himself here as he said that I am thirsty. Perhaps that maybe Jesus thirsted in that same manner, a parched by the dry emptiness of the sin of the world. He was parched, he was thirsting, because all of the sin of all mankind fell upon him. The parched, dry thirst that it brought, 
and the emptiness of sin uh, filled his uh, filled his body, filled his mouth, filled his throat. You know, and, and as he uttered on the on the cross, "It is finished." He said, as he gave up the spirit, uh, uh, in uh, in the gospel. Look at Matthew twenty-seven, uh, verse fifty-seven, guys. You know, all of this is in kind of a way of an introduction to uh, this Sunday morning's message, Resurrection Sunday. Guys, uh, we know that Good Friday was, was a great Friday, not so much as uh, uh, because we had the day off, because we had colored Easter eggs and ate all the good food and all of that. But Good Friday became a great Friday for us as Jesus laid his life down on the cross for the sin of all the world, for the sin of you and I today, the sin that separated, the sin that caused uh, eternal separation from all the great things he had promised. Verse 57 of chapter 27, and uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll skip back up, guys, to uh, verse 50 in chapter 27. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and they appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when the earth uh, they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said truly this was the son of God you know they became believers is all they saw at the death of Jesus Christ uh, many of the women were looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him and among them Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mothers of the sons of Zebedee and when it came evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Uh, for this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Here we find the faithful guys now emboldened, uh, uh, went to the governor to ask permission to take the body of Jesus. We're told along with Joseph of Arimathea was this one called Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus, we remember in John chapter 3, was the one, uh, was the one who came to Jesus under the cover of night. I love this guy Nicodemus, guys. Nicodemus was a very upright man. He was one who was respected in the community in Jerusalem. He was one who was very generous. He gave. He was one who did many good works. But yet deep within him, and you know, he was very religious, uh, going to the temple and, 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 and seeking God. But he was one who was uh, very religious. Yet within his heart, there was a spot that was empty. There was a hole that was in his heart. And he was seeking to fill that hole with good works and good deeds. And, you know, I'm sure he loved uh, the people thought of him as a good person and a good man. But yet it, 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 it did no satisfaction. It brought no satisfaction to him. He came to Jesus under the cover of darkness. And he says, hey, Lord, what, you know, what, what do we have to do? What is, you know, what are you about? What about this thing about eternal life? And are you really the, the Messiah, the one that we were waiting for, you know, to, to come to Israel? And uh, he had all these questions, and Jesus says, "Hey, you got to be born again, and and uh, simply you, you have to receive Jesus into your heart. You have to receive Him as your Lord and Savior. You you need to ask Him, Lord, please forgive me my sins, the sins that separate me, and be born again uh, by the Spirit of God." He says, "Hey, how can a man be born again? Can he climb back into a, his mother and be really born again?" And Jesus said, "No." It's a birth of the spirit, not of the flesh. 
And uh, many of us have come to know uh, this born again experience because we've been born again, not in the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. And the same thing that Nicodemus had come and sought out was the same message that God told him. He says, for God, uh, uh, God so loved the world that he sent his son, his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus simply laid out the gospel message that whoever would receive Jesus into their hearts would be saved from eternal separation uh, from God. And, uh, you know, we would go into eternity. One of our uh, great uh, old brothers uh, that we've known for many, many years, we caught word that he had just uh, uh, died, you know, overnight. And uh, uh, it seemed quite sudden. It quite, seemed quite mysterious. But we were talking about it, and we just thought that, hey, the last breath that he took in this earth, uh, the very next breath he took, was he was in heaven with the Lord for all eternity. And he slipped from one life into the other, from the, the life here on this earth, from life uh, eternal in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, here we see that uh, in 62, now the next day, the, next, uh, the day of preparation, 2762, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered with uh, Pilate and, uh, 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 and, and they said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, the deceiver said, that deceiver they called him, and after three days I am to rise again. Therefore they gave orders for the grave to be made secure and, uh, uh, until the third day. Otherwise the disciples might come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a guard, go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal over the stone. The religious, religious leaders sought to cover all the bases, guys, but all to no avail. Let, they said to themselves, let's make sure that no one comes for the body of Jesus to fulfill his words. Because Jesus all along had said that, yeah, on the third day I'm going to rise again. And they said that we got to ensure that nobody comes, nothing is perpetuated, we'll put a seal, a guard on the tomb, we'll put a seal on the stone, and uh, this thing is not going to happen. But look with me at, at chapter 28, if you have your Bible. And after the Sabbath, it became to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave, and uh, behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Can you imagine as these two faithful sisters, guys, they went down to the gravesite, probably to, uh, to, to ponder and, and maybe to mourn the loss of their beloved Lord, uh, only to be part of an earth-shaking experience that left the stone rolled away from the tomb. But not only that, an angel of the Lord sat in attendance upon the throne. And can you imagine that, guys? A severe earthquake, an angel of the Lord descending upon, uh, descending from heaven, just sitting on the stone and kind of sitting and waiting. And I don't know if he was waiting for them, but he sat there uh, overseeing things. And uh, uh, his appearance, we're told, was like lightning. His clothing was as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear because of him, and they became like dead men. And, the, uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're told that his appearance was at, as lightning. Now, I know most of us have watched, and hopefully from a distance, the flashes of lightning in a thunderstorm, a thunder and lightning storm, tremendous arcs and flashes that caused the temple guards to quake with fear. They were filled with fear. They were filled were trembling. Can you imagine the brightness of the glory of God that shone upon them and shone about them? We can only imagine uh, how great it is. And some have said that they've, they've seen uh, 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 within the worship service and within various uh, meetings uh, ongoing, they've seen these bright lights. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I don't mean to spiritualize, uh, spiritualize things, but some have said that they've seen uh, these appearances uh, within the worship services. And uh, again, I can only imagine how great that is. But verse 5, he goes on, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know who you're looking for, Jesus who was crucified. The angel re re uh, reassures the sisters 
uh, the faithful that it's okay, it's okay. And isn't God just like that? Isn't the Lord just like that? A lot of times in uncertainty, a lot of times in fear, a lot of times as our whole world is shaking, guys, is being shaken by things beyond our control. You know, it's God that says to us, He comes and He whispers to us, and sometimes it's in a loud voice, sometimes it's in a very soft voice. I know, He told them. I know who you're looking for. I know who you're seeking. It's going to be okay. It's, it's all right. And, you know, I, and I think that as long as we're seeking the true and the living God, it will be okay. It'll be all right. Because you know why? God is control. I love to go back to the prophet Isaiah, where the prophet saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated upon the throne. The train of his robe filled the temple with glory. And we know that uh, today the temple of God, as was in the Old Testament times, the temple was a brick and mortar building and so on and so forth. But today the temple of God is likened to be the, the, uh, the Lord dwelling within the heart and life of man. And when you think that, you know, as you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the temple of his robe, uh, the, the glory of the, uh, uh, the, the Lord fills the temple with glory. And, you know, as he fills us with his glory, as he fills us with his spirit, as he fills us with all the hope and the reassurance, no matter if the world is shaking, no matter if the world is quaking, he's always there for us. And if everything is going smooth and, and so on, uh, it's a great thing. But, you know, expect the curveballs, expect the, the trials and the testings and the temptations to come. But, you know, again, the angel reassured the women, it's, it's okay, it's going to be all right. I know who you're looking for, uh, and I, I, I know that uh, it'll be good. Verse 6 says, uh, He is not here, for he is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he was lying. But he's not here, he goes. Come and see for yourself, he is risen. And, uh, uh, you, you know, as excited or as calm as we can stay, a God, uh, death could no, had no hold over the Lord. He had risen from the dead, and, and the angel said, Come and see, he is risen. Seven, he, he goes on, he says, Go quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Uh, go quickly was the word from the angel. There was urgency. Go and tell the others that he has risen from the dead. Here's the plan. Meet him in Galilee, uh, and, uh, and he will reveal himself to you. And again, a very explicit, very clear is, God's, is the, the messenger's word to the people. He said, go quickly. And at times, uh, we go quickly to others. At times, we go quickly to the Lord in times of trouble. At times, there is urgency in, in, in uh, God's instructions. We can see it in the Gospel of Mark. There was always uh, immediately they went, immediately they took care, immediately they prayed, immediately they, they ministered. There was urgency in God's uh, word and God's message. The Lord was here with us for three years here in this earth and he knew that there was an awful lot to accomplish. In that three-year period of time, there was urgency. For us, the urgency today, as we see the things uh, uh, around the world taking place, you know, several weeks ago, we gave a more prophetic message on a Sunday morning. Uh, it is in our archive messages, but we talked about the stage being set for things coming down in the pipeline, for future things uh, as described uh, in the book of Revelation and so on. But quite an interesting message. Uh, there was urgency in the voice of the angel. Uh, he laid out the instructions. In verse 8, he says, They left the tomb quickly, and with fear and with great joy, they ran to report it to the disciples. There the women went with mixed feelings and mixed emotions. Can you imagine these ladies? They must have been really uh, just uh, besides themselves. No, it's fear. It's with fear mixed with great joy. There was uncertainty. There was a little bit of, wow, I can't believe this happened. And, you know, they must have been shaking and quaking themselves. Yet, um, mixed with that was great joy. They, had, they were rejoicing in their hearts and their lives. Uh, the Greek word for um, uh, this word great, our, uh, our English word great, is translated as very great, most greatly, 
plenteous, abundant. They ran with great excitement. You know, that, that word great cannot imagine or cannot portray the real uh, uh, great joy that they felt. In 9, they, uh, 9 and 10, it says that, Then behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. And there they will see me. Isn't it just like our Lord? He didn't appear to the 12 disciples. He didn't de de appear to Peter or to John or, or John, you know, and uh, these great uh, apostles and so on. But he, he met, first of all, with these two sisters, these two faithful sisters, humble servants and worshipers of the Lord, guys. Isn't that just like the Lord? He came to these two wonderful sisters do not be afraid, he says. Go and take the word. Uh, leave for Galilee. There you will see me. Very simple. He laid it out for them. Uh, do not be afraid. And, and again, today we live in fearful times. Today, people are filled with fear and anxiety. And yet Jesus says, hey, do not be afraid. And we don't want to flaunt our freedom and liberty that we have in uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, we want to just understand that without the, the Holy Spirit, without the Lord dwelling in their hearts, without the perfect love of Christ that casts out all fear, people are feel, filled with fear. People are filled with uncertainty. And again, the word for today is that we look upon these that don't know the Lord, that don't have the certainty and the confidence in Christ Jesus, that he's in control of everything. Whether, you know, I know that there are many Christians going through difficult times today. Many Christians were on the forefront of the first layoffs down in Waikiki because they worked in the hotels. They worked in the restaurants. They worked in the showrooms. And the showrooms went dark. The lights went off. The guys lost their jobs. They worked at the rent-a-car centers. The rent-a-cars stopped renting. They're, they're piled up in the stadium parking lot. Uh, they, they, they lost their job immediately. Those that uh, worked in the gyms and the workout places, which were so popular and so on, they closed the gyms. They closed the theaters. They closed this. They closed that. And many Christians were involved in that. Many lost their jobs, and that's why I say, be thankful if you're working to have jobs. Be thankful for that which God has provided for us. But he says, uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the situation. Uh, take my word. Uh, 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 leave for Galilee. You know, follow my instructions. You know, follow. what does he say? Hey, I would never leave you, nor forsake you, you know. Uh, trust not, he says, uh, trust, uh, uh, lean not on your own understanding. Trust in me. Trust in my word, and I will make that way for you. There you will see me. And in the midst of all the trouble, in the midst of all the circumstance and question and doubt and fear, you know, he's right in the midst there with us. So, you know, today, the, that thing is that for we, uh, uh, we, we ought to uh, convey that, you know, whether it's a word of encouragement, it's, it's going to be okay, let me pray for you, uh, 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 can you, can you call upon uh, the name of Jesus, can you ask Jesus, can you pray to the Lord that he might come and help you during this time. Verse 11, he goes, Now when they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests and, uh, that all that had happened. Uh, note two happenings, guys. The sisters, the two sisters went their way uh, as Jesus instructed them. The guards came into the city and reported all that happened. Two different, different scenarios, guys. The faithful and the fooled or the foolish. Both went about the business at hand. Uh, where would you want to be, guys? Would you want to be about the Lord's business or the world's business today? Do you want to be about the Lord's business, filled with the confidence and the joy and uh, uh, the reassurance, don't be afraid? Or do you want to go about the world's business? Hey, this is what came down. This is what happened. We're reporting to you guys because we're trying to... Uh, 
cover our okole because of this. But in 12, uh, 12 to 15, uh, they go on to say, and when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. Isn't it just right? Hey, you want to fix the situation, what do you do? Throw money at it. What is it? You get the envelope or you, uh, you go like this and uh, 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 I, you see the hand? <laughs> Just put the fat white envelope in the hand. And again, they, they gave them a large sum of money to the soldiers. And they said, you are to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if, the, if they should come to the governor's ears, uh, we will win him over, keep you out of trouble. They took the money as they did as they had been instructed. And the story was widely spread among the Jews. And it is to this day. Again, guys, uh, the great cover-up. Isn't it just like the world? Cover-up after cover-up. Closed-door meetings. Hey, we, we, this is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to say. This is exactly how the world operates. Plans hatched in secrecy. Payoffs and backdoor deals. You know, I could tell you a few stories, but we just don't have the time. And again, these are the things that go on. These are the things, oh, you never have to go pay for it. You never have to go to court. We can fix it. We can take care of this. We can take care of that. 16 and 17, they said, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. Here it is, you know, two classes of people, even though these were followers of the Lord. Uh, they, they were following, maybe following uh, from a distance or following with a little bit of reservation or not wholeheartedly into it. Some, some they, they, they saw, some worship, some disbelieved or they doubted. Which group are you in today? Are you all in? Is it like that Texas, uh, what, what is it, uh, that poker you used to see on TV? All in, I'm all in. And you know, are you all in for the Lord today? You know, are you sitting on the fence? Is there a little bit of doubt? Or are you a worshiper? Uh, here in 18, they said, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, uh, even to the end of the age. Here's that last Oh, uh, that promise of the Lord. He says, hey, I am with you even to the end of the age. Don't worry about it. You know, uh, trust in me. Herein lies the great commission, our mission today for the church. You know, we take, we share the gospel. We go out, we reassure people, we comfort people. Uh, and, and again, uh, we make disciples of all mankind. We, we, we teach them to, um, uh, to observe your word, Lord. And I am with you even to the end of the age. Here's the promise of God. Well, the book of Acts tells us that, uh, that he presented himself alive after his sufferings, appearing to his disciples for a period of 40 days. Isn't that interesting? He appeared to his disciples uh, in, in uh, Israel, in Jerusalem, in Galilee, and uh, he was there for 40 days appearing to uh, his disciples, uh, sp uh, speaking uh, uh, of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And today the words uh, uh, still ring loud and clear. The question is, are you a worshiper or do you doubt or do you even disbelieve? Are you a worshiper or are you a doubter or a disbeliever? We would like to give you an opportunity right where you are to open your heart and pray and receive the resurrected Lord into your heart. You can pray silently. Just believe it in your heart. Why don't we pray? Father God, we do want to thank you for this morning. We thank you for the, the, the cry, He is risen, that resounded uh, so loudly throughout the community, Lord, with, throughout the territory in Jerusalem and, and Judea and Galilee, Lord. And the words, He is risen, uh, still rings out today loud and clear right around the world, Father. And as people are sitting in the comfort of their home or where, wherever they might be, uh, watching this message, uh, hearing this message on their personal devices or on their computer, Lord, we want to give the opportunity that whether worshiper or whether, whether a doubter, Lord, uh, uh, if, or a disbeliever, Lord, they might come right before you, Lord, especially for those 
uh, Lord, uh, for, for the believers, we, we come to worship you, Lord. And for the others, Lord, we want to come and give the opportunity for you to receive Jesus Christ right into your heart, uh, right where you're at. It's, he's simply a prayer away. And if you would just pray with me, uh, believing in your heart, you can say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me. Wash me and cleanse me. Come into my heart. Fill that empty hole within me with all of your love and with all of your joy. Lord, help me to follow you all the days of my life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for those who have uh, prayed that prayer. Please uh, send us an email or a message and We'd love to pray with you and uh, follow up uh, with a word of encouragement for you. Otherwise, God bless. We're finishing the song here.